Recently, Sarah and I, as, as young parents, have been discussing what's the most important thing that we can pass to our children. Is it an education? We think, yeah, that's very important. Is it, is it a wealth of knowledge? Well, in that case, my kids from my side are in trouble. <laughs> Make with their mother. And, and as a Christian, what are the values that we're going to pass to our little ones? And in talking through some of these things, I, I think probably the most important that our kids will ever learn from our life is the ability to be thankful. Because I believe joy is derived from thankfulness. Have you ever come across someone in your life that's just incredibly joyful? They make an impact. In fact, in preparing for this message, I had to stop and think. It took me a while. Now, there are those that give this pretense that they're joyful, but if you spend enough time with them, you realize sometimes it's, it's a charade. But I remember as a child, my great-grandmother, her name was Benny Ford. She uh, had a dress shop in Texas. And during the war, I remember her telling stories vividly as a child, during the war, the supplies were low. And they couldn't, they couldn't make things go around. And she tried to keep her shop going. And of course, as soon as the war was over, one of the, one of the images that comes to mind was she told me that the ladies would line her shop for three blocks to get a pair of nylons. <laughs> they hadn't had that in so long. But one thing that really, really spoke to me as a child about my grand was that she was always joyful. One story in particular, we had gone to a, a large supermarket, maybe Kmart, Walmart, well, I don't know if Walmart was around then, but I remember getting out of the car and there was a huge oil spill on the ground. Of course, naturally we would say, that's disgusting, someone's car, it's going to ruin this, that, and the other. And the thought I had was negative right off the bat as a child. But my grand looked at it and she said, you see all those pretty colors? reflecting in there. And she saw the good in everything. And of course, she, she had a wonderful, productive life, blessed many people. And I think as a parent, this is something that Sarah and I are trying to pass to our children. The difficulty is, we can speak about it, we can teach about it, but our children catch more than we teach. In other words, more is caught than taught. So as a parent, it's our job to model this, and it's very difficult. But I think, honestly, if we, were, if we were really truthful, joy doesn't come naturally. Some of us have to, have to work for it. And again, I believe the key to experiencing true joy is giving thanks. Let's look at our text this morning, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day that you heard it, and you knew the grace of God in truth. Pray with me, if you will. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this truth, that your grace has been given freely for us. Because of the cross, we stand redeemed. Father, when the world and the flesh and the devil say we're nothing because of you and because of truth. Greater are, are, are we because of you being in us than anything that we face in this world. Father, help us to understand this truth this morning with thanksgiving and how it can change our life if we focus it in you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Eucharisteo is the Greek word for giving thanks. Now this word envelops the Greek root word charis, meaning grace. And the derivative, chara, which is Greek for joy. Now, eucharisteo is an attitude of joy and gratefulness 
despite one's circumstances. I think the goal of most people today is happiness. The problem with happiness, most of the time, it's derived upon happenings. So if your happenings aren't good, then life isn't good. I believe Eucharisteo is something far deeper. It's a joy that we can have in spite of awful circumstances. The book of Colossians is a letter written to a group of people in Colossae. The author, the Apostle Paul, had been beaten, incarcerated, and he was very uncertain of his future. He pins this letter to the people there in Colossae. And in this letter, it bubbles with Eucharisteo. In spite of Paul's awful circumstances, he saw the ability to give thanks. In his letter at the beginning of Colossians, we're going to see this morning three principles that we can learn from Paul concerning the attitude of thankfulness. So notice first, in developing a spirit of Eucharisteo, we must be other-oriented. Look at verse 3. Paul says this as he writes, We give thanks to God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. Now what's interesting, knowing Paul's circumstances, knowing that he's been beaten, knowing that he's in chains, knowing that he's in the bowels of, of Rome, in their prison, <coughs> he can still exude this spirit of thanksgiving. What is it? What is it about Paul that enables him to see beyond his circumstances? Here's what I believe. Paul's attention was looking for the good in others. Think about that. If we constantly focus on our own negative circumstances or our bad situations, it's hard to see the good in anything. So I believe Paul purposely is penning this letter and he's showing people an attitude of gratitude. If he were to focus on his own negative situation, it would have flown through this pen. And it would have been in the canon of Scripture. But he sees differently. At some point in Paul's life, he realized life wasn't about Paul. And remind, I want to remind you this morning, folks, it's not about us. Manifesting Eucharisteo, it isn't easy. Just this week, a dear friend lost his father. You may be facing trials in your life. I had a prayer request shared with me this morning, a heavy one. Please ask God. Let's move God to do this thing for us in our life. How do we manifest the spirit of thanksgiving in the most difficult of circumstances? We see in Paul that his attention was focused on the good of others. He said, I saw your faith. I didn't just see your words. I saw your life in action. In fact, these Colossians were enacting James chapter 2. When scripture says, yes, you can say you have faith. And you can believe the right things, but if it doesn't move us into a spirit of blessing, it's dead. It's dead orthodoxy. And Paul said, I saw your faith in action, your love for all the brethren. Here's a guy that could have said, you know, my circumstances aren't real good. In fact, why don't you send a group to come and rescue me? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't lament or be bemoan the fact that things are very difficult in his life. In fact, I'm sure he's even contemplating the possibility that he may die. But still, he could see beyond that and focus on the good of others. And I challenge you this morning, even in your own life when circumstances are incredibly difficult, when life is throwing curveballs at you, when situations are miserable, focus on others. It's not about us. The second principle in developing a spirit of Eucharisteo is to understand where our joy lies. Look at verse 5. Paul says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of truth, the gospel? Recently I heard a story of a ship that was sinking, and in the middle of the storm the captain calls out to the crew and says, Does anyone here know how to pray? Of course, one man stepped forward and said, yes, sir, I know how to pray. 
The captain said, wonderful. You pray while the rest of us put on life jackets. We're one short. <laughs> Sometimes life is rough. Sometimes circumstances can affect or even hijack our affections. But I want to remind you, as Paul did to these Colossians, our hope isn't here and now. We may have momentary blips of goodness. Hallelujah for those. But the reality is, life is hard. Life is difficult. I really am thankful that God brought my dear wife to me. We had a wonderful conversation this morning about the difficulties of life and wrestling with truth. When things come out of nowhere, just arbitrarily, they almost knock the legs out from underneath you. You go, what is going on? I believe at that time it's okay to ask God why. When you see these heroes of the faith, Job, you ask God why. <laughs> David, Moses, no, God, that's beyond your character. What would the Egyptians think? Abraham, others as well. Asking God why. That's good. You're wrestling with the reality of life. But may I remind you, our hope and joy will not be found here, folks. And sometimes we're holding on to this life as if it's the only thing. Paul is reminding us in this beautiful letter, it's not here. The hope you have is laid for you in heaven. In the word of truth, the gospel. More than likely, focusing our attention on things here and now will lead to a spirit of despair. Later on, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because this earth is temporal. It's fleeting. What's here today will be gone in the future. So as we hold on to this life, hold it loosely. As the trials come, no. As the song says, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Church, our joy comes from understanding that one day, these circumstances, these trials, these hardships, and these storms, they will be gone. And we can give thanks for the coming day when God will redeem all the horrible things in this life. Because of the cross, we are redeemed. Colossians 1 verse 20. And Jesus, having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Listen to the truth of Scripture, folks. Our joy comes from above. You, if you've lived long enough, you know this to be true. The next job doesn't fulfill you. The next paycheck, even if it's greater, will not fulfill you. Even a spouse will not fulfill you or complete you. The only thing that complete you is under, to complete you is to understand that our hope lies in the heavens. It lies in Christ. So in the midst of the tribulation and distress, peril, please rest in the truth that God's going to fix all things and He started at Calvary. We can give thanks for this coming day when we will be rescued. Listen to the truth. The third principle in developing a spirit for you for sale is to understand God's grace. This is very important. <clears throat> it will not make sense. We cannot be thankful if we don't understand this. Look at verse 5 again, Colossians chapter 1. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true word of the gospel, that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. There are many hearers, but I don't think they truly grasp the depth of this grace that God has bestowed to us. It is nearly impossible to be thankful in life if you do not understand God's good news. It's called the gospel. Through the cross, God has rescued everyone. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish. Right now we're perishing. The hour the body perishes, we know this every morning when we get up, 
<laughs> this week I was reminded of it. I'm not a young whippersnapper anymore. <laughs> I was helping Jim do some things, and I tell you what, the next day after moving some things, I couldn't barely move. It's <laughs> pitiful. I'm not looking forward to the future. The body breaks down. We know this. The knees <laughs> ache. The back cracks. But the Bible says the inward man can be renewed and growing daily. Why? Because of this grace. Focusing on the heavenly, the joy that God brings, not in the temporal. Remember, this is the good news. Christ died that you would have life. Let me ask you, is this life growing in you? Is his life bearing fruit through you? Or do you not understand this grace? This grace is freely given. Not of works that we could earn it, because we would boast. But it's something that the God of gods, the I Am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the last, has said, I will give to you. Why? Because I love you. If this hasn't resonated with you, see me today. Let's make sure of this. Because until this grace is embraced, there's no way you can truly embrace Eucharisteo. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What a, what a wonderful message. It's called the good news. Jesus came to put away sin. And one day, folks, in the future, he will eradicate all of this evil. We can be thankful for this. In spite of the diagnosis. In spite of the financial crisis. In spite of the marital turmoil, we work through that knowing that hope <coughs> lies in the future. In spite of here and now, we focus on the truth of God's Word. My challenge to you is this. Do you frequ frequently bring to mind this good news? Or do you focus on other news? Think about it. What are your news sources? This is why it's very important to take time every day to renew your mind in the truth of Scripture. We know the evil one is a deceiver. And he's a liar. He's a supplanter. He's a murderer. And all he wants you to do is entertain fallacy. Entertain an untruth and he's got you. What are you listening to? Evaluate your life. Evaluate your sources. Is it centered and grounded in truth? The only source for constant thankfulness is the grace that God died to give us. Think about that. So in closing, understand that there are many variables in this life that affect you or infect you. There are free agents that are attempting to subvert God's good plan of rescue and salvation. The principalities and powers, their goal is to destroy Scripture says Satan walketh about as a lion looking whom he may destroy or devour. So there is this evil that's trying to destroy the good that God has given. And we find that evil things happen as a result of those agents abusing their freedoms. God has given us a choice. We have freedom. All the way back from the beginning of the garden, he warns, get your life from me. Finding your life from another source will destroy you. Hence the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Of course, man chose to find life outside of God. And since that time, everything's running chaotically. Nothing's running according to plan. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. As God enters humanity, becomes small like no other God. Doesn't lord over people with a sword. But he hangs on a cross. This God died for you. This guy laid down his life for you. So the story doesn't end at the fall. The story really begins at the resurrection. So as these agents are trying to subvert God's plan to hijack truth, remember. Remember, because of their freedom, those choices will affect you. You've seen people in life that are living a lie. They're living a lie that they're worthless, so they drown their sorrows with alcohol. Then unfortunately, they get in the car and try to drive. And they maim someone else. That is the force of evil at work. God has nothing to do with that. Keep in mind, because of freedom, another's choice will affect your life. 
We find that evil things happen as a result of those agents abusing their freedom. How it's important for us as Christ followers to use our freedom for good. So remember, evil does not come from God. But remember this, when we see good, attribute that to God. James 1 verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is good. He doesn't change. He's not arbitrary one day and the next day he's good. He's always good. God is love. So when you're seeing evil and it's ugly and it's dark, don't attribute that to God. Attribute that to evil. The evil that God will one day take away. The evil that God is working on in our own life as we work out our own salvation. Even if your life is characterized by pain and suffering, you can still celebrate Eucharist day. Embrace it. Give thanks for the good you see in others. Be looking for others. Look for what they're doing. Don't focus here. It's not about you. Give thanks because God's grace has freely been offered to you. Take it. Take hold of that. And lastly, give thanks because you can experience heavenly joy 